Thank you very much. This is such a precious time for us to be here, and it's really a privilege. You know, um, I have to tell you something that uh, 20-some years ago was the first time um, I had been in the, in the States. Uh, and um, at that time, uh, th this was the very first church that I went came. This, this is the first church I visited in the U.S. And a lot of you became lifelong friends. We love you. And uh, this has really became a home for us. I, I remember that uh, at that time, I wrote, I, when we just moved, uh, I wrote a letter to my wife um, from Memphis, 20 plus year, 25 years ago. And I said, well, people are really nice here. I love everything here, but I, I hope I never have to come back. <laughs> Now, uh, the, the, uh, well, the truth is that actually six and a half years ago, we moved here. We never, we never thought that um, that's what we're going to do, but God called us uh, here. That's another story. And uh, I have a lot of great memories uh, about this church. Um, one is very uh, peculiar. Uh, it's a, it was kind of a cultural shock when Larry Parrish and Bob Stanley took me to a Redbirds game. And... Uh, that was just uh, an outstanding experience uh, to learn how passionate some people about putting things into a scorebook, which I had no idea what that is. I, I know nothing about baseball. I just saw white pillows, and people were running around white pillows, and, <laughs> and, and sometimes they were spitting and hitting. <laughs> you know, that, that was, that's all what I, what I understood about the game. And, and that's how much I understand right now. Although I, I live in Kansas City where, where the real Royals are pretty famous. Um, but uh, I have to admit that in the middle of the game, I had to stand up and I said, I can't take it anymore. So I left. <laughs> so, uh, but, but. Now, the problem is that I have no idea what inning is. So, and and <laughs> okay. So so uh, another great memory of the, uh, that. Um, I think one of the first time I walked into this church and um, Bob Stanley walked into. Uh, there was a Bible study where I was speaking, and he asked me if I'm from Mississippi. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> obviously, I'm not. So. Um, what I want to what I want to share, you know, uh, today is just to to bring you into my personal journey. You know, we, every every person is created as spiritual beings, and we all on a, on a journey. And God writes our story, and He invites us to be the co-author of our story. So He gave us authority to to write with Him part of part of our story. And uh, my story. Um, helps me and gives me conviction why why I have decided or God called me and just to be be in in full time ministry and sharing the gospel because the the healing that I have experienced was just um so remarkable uh in my personal life that I thought that well the the greatest thing that happened to me was that I got to know Jesus and the greatest the greatest thing I can do is to help others to get to know Jesus as well. So uh, let me let me start that with this: that you know, like it or not, we all are born into other people's stories. Our story is a sequel to the story of our ancestors. We have not determined that we are born into that story. We born we are born into their dysfunction their problems, and their sickness. The sins of our ancestors live marks on us, just as their virtue does. So, of course, uh, we are not determined to guide our life and live our life and, and guide our story uh, by how it was said by them. We have the freedom to make, make choices, but we cannot ignore the impact that their story has on our story. So my personal story is flowing out of our family's story, 
which is woven into the tragic history of my nation. Uh, and my nation's past uh, 90 years. Fascism and communism left deep marks and cruel marks, uh, not just on Hungary as a nation, but on our family too. After the First World War, Hungary uh, lost two-thirds of its territory and about 60% of its population. And um, soon after that, in the 19, er, 19, uh, early 1930s, the tragic signs of Jewish persecution, anti-Semitism started to show up. My mother's side of the family has Jewish background, and it's deeply impacted them. The only only two have survived the horror of the Holocaust. And uh, the family lost all of their wealth, most of their members. Uh, World War II ended with the horror of the Soviet regime. So going from fascism to communism. My grandmother had been raped by a dozen Russian soldiers witnessed by my mother, who was only five at that time. Uh, being a Jew at that time meant that my great-grandfather lost everything. Houses, businesses, he was really a wealthy person, money, siblings, parents, job. Uh, and on top of that, her daughter being brutally raped. So um, my grandmother became pregnant from that and that uh, later aborted that baby. And later she had 17 abortions. And my mother had many too. Uh, my great-grandfather was the survival of the family. It's more than anyone can absorb. So these losses came with excruciating pain and the bottle became his painkiller. After the Nazis were defeated, the Soviet army took control over the country. My father's side of the family being part of the nobility since the 1200s uh, and giving up many top leaders of the Hungarian army were viewed as the enemies of the communists. So at the end of the war, my great uncle, a former army general, was taken to the Soviet gulags. The Soviet gulags was a form of labor camp, which was equivalent to the, to, um, for, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, it's a, concentration camp. He spent there 11 years and miraculously survived and just showed up in 1956 at his wife's doorstep. She did not know if she was, if, if he was dead or not. I mean, nothing, but, but she was waiting for him. And he just showed up. And um, the 1950s were very dark times of the newly established communist regime as it reached the peak of its brutality. My grandfather, grandmother, my father had been deported at the beginning of the decade, decade. Their home and all of their belongings were confiscated by the government and they were put in a labor camp. They had to do forced labor. That's, um, that's a kind of a, a form of slavery, what they did. My grandfather got a stroke there and died. Uh, the only so the only descendant of a once wealthy Jewish family and the only descendant of a once wealthy noble family met and fell in love. Their marriage could have never happened if the war and communism would have not destroyed both families equally because in society, Jews and nobility were never um, getting married. The 1956 revolution found my parents in their late teenage years. My mother's uncle had been shot by the communist a year earlier and had been buried in an unmarked grave. He was only 24. During the revolution, all the boys in my mother's class died. Um, the Soviets who quenched the revolution just killed it. Everybody, my parents as young and adventurous lovers wanted to escape from the country. Uh, a young 19-year-old soldier helped them passing through the borders. 
uh, to Austria, uh, but they get caught. Uh, immediately, the Soviets shot the 19-year-old uh, soldier, and my parents was imprisoned. The horror of the war, fascism, and communism left a lasting mark on my wife's family as well. Her grandparents buried two little babies because they starved to death. There was no food for them. The pain caused by history was multiplied by the pain caused by the members of the family. Betrayal, cheating, alcoholism, sexual, physical, and verbal abuse, abortions, occultism, occultism were present as an everyday practice in both sides of the family. My story enters into the brokenness of this family. My parents already went through a divorce from each other, and they tried to rebuild their broken marriage. They got married again in 1966. I came as, as an unplanned surprise, and they had one plan, abortion. My sister was four years old at that time, and my parents were without a home. But a friend of my mom, who is still unknown to me, convinced my mother to keep this pregnancy. I was born unwanted. This word prophetically shadowed my childhood. I do not have time to go into details about the abusiveness of my father, but it got so bad that um, it for like he forced me to walk on my broken leg. Um, he was physically terrorizing me and, and abusing me. I was eight years old when my parents got a divorce and the judge decided that I'll stay with my, my dad and my sister will stay with my mom. So this way nobody has to pay alimony. And um, <clears throat> the next five years were hell for me. I got so sick that the doctors told my mom that I'll be dead by the age of 18 or 20. Uh, there was a year when I spent 200 days in the hospital. Uh, finally, at age 13, I ran away from my father because he wanted to see me dead. It's a longer story and I don't have time to share, but I was completely destroyed by him and by the family background. I had to appear before the judge at 13 uh, um, because the police was chasing me and my mother, I was hiding in, a, in an attic of a hospital. That's a, um, a, a different story. But um, I, I had to appear before the judge, and, and she asked me, you know, who do I want to live with? And I told them I want to live with my mother. But, um, you know, I was crying. I was completely devastated. I stuttered. I was so destroyed that in eighth grade, the teacher told my mom, that she should not send me to high school because I was so dumb. I have not seen my father for nine years after that, uh, uh, after I ran away. Uh, but even if I saw a picture of him, I get such an asthma and panic attack that the ambulance had to take me to the doctor, to the, to the hospital. Uh, so here I am at age 13, at the end of 1979, deeply wounded, without any hope. Our family, our country, and my personal life is without any hope. Generations after generations are destroyed. So how do you live your life not repeating all the generational curses? Can you change the blood? How do you heal from that? How do you get to a point where you can function normally as a human being? How do you move on? How do you forgive your father? How do you forgive your country? How do you forgive your surrounding countries? How do you forgive the Soviets? How, how, do, how do you live that? So um, how do you not become hateful, resentful, bittered? How do you not become a hopeless alcoholic or, de or dependent on drug? or some, some kind of uh, substance abuse. I was deeply wounded, and I had all the re reason to be resentful, 
toward my father, to hate my country's leaders, to hate all the surrounding countries, and pretty much everybody. So uh, I, was, I felt I'm done. I was done with my father, with my mother's second and third marriage. I mean, that was just, you know, I was done with the Russians, Romanians, Ukrainians, Serbs, the communists, everybody. Deep wounds don't heal fast. My healing came slowly. My high school years uh, were my first firm steps toward God. You know, I was 13 years old when I first heard the name Jesus. Nobody was a believer because it was forbidden to, to believe that, uh, in Jesus. Uh, so when I first encountered the message, uh, actually it was my stepfather's cousin who was a believer. And I thought he's just crazy. You know, nobody believes in God. Uh, and and uh, when he told me that God can become your heavenly father who loves you, who cares for you. That's when I first started to take my first steps toward God. I never forget the life-changing moment when the very first time I personally felt the, he the healing touch of God in my life. That happened right before I started high school. I opened the Bible. He, g he gave me a Bible. I opened the Bible. I mean, I never read anything in the, from the Bible. I hardly knew. I, I've heard the name Jesus from him, and that, but, but really did not understand the gospel. But he told and I opened the Bible and I read this verse. The passage was Isaiah 54. And I felt pierced by every single word I read. I felt like it just healing my soul. My soul started in my heart. My hurting heart was just starting to heal. And this is what I, what I read. You will forget the shame of your youth. And then for a brief moment, I deserted you. But with great compassion, I, I will gather you. With everlasting love, I will have compassion on you. And all these words just started to heal my soul. At age 14, as a new believer, I was so excited about my newly found faith. So I got into the high school, which was a miracle. Because I stuttered, I mean, I was so behind and, and everything. But I went up to the teacher, and I denied the demand of my high of my school to become a member of the Young Communist Party. Every student had to become a member, and I told him, "I'm not going to be a member of the Young Communist Party because I believe in God and I believe in Jesus." So the teacher told me that. I remember that they, they took me to the to the vice principal. And he said, you cut your own throat, kid. You're never going to go to university. I mean, you have to be a, a member of the Young Communist Party and all that. But I said, I don't care. Okay, it's, I, I believe in Jesus. I'm not going to. Um, but God had other plans later. So it took me nine years before. So after I ran away from my father, it took me nine years before I was able to go back to my father and forgive him. I have not seen him for nine years. The Lord healed my wounds so much that I started to feel a compassion for him. How miserable he must be to live a life like that. And um, I felt that I'm, it must be just terrible to be so angry and so upset all the time and to yell all the time and to, to beat everybody all the time. I mean, that's, that's a terrible way of existence. So I felt compassion that I, I want to go back and, and tell him that I, I forgive him because Jesus forgave me and Jesus can forgive him too. My, I remember that my mother was furious. Why do, I, why do you go back to someone who, who, is, who wanted to see you dead, who hated you so much, who beated you? And um, but I, I not only went back once, but I went back regularly to him. Because when we got married and we started to have kids, I wanted him to experience what it means to be a grandfather. But he never thought that he did anything wrong. 
So he died when he died 13 years ago. He excluded us from all from his lost will. He just hated us and completely rejected not just me, but my kids. He did not respect that his own mother and own parents to pass even a little thing, a, a memory to his own grandchildren. And that's just resentment. And that's what resentment does. If you have resentment about your past or bitterness, that's murderous. It will kill you. You remember the story of Cain and Abel when Cain was resentful because he did not understand why God treated Abel better than him. So what did he do? He killed his brother. He wanted to kill God, but he couldn't. He was upset with God. And he killed his brother. I mean, if, if we have resentment over things that happened in our past, and we don't move on by God's grace, if we don't get healed, then we're going to kill our own future. So at that moment, I was so thankful that Jesus healed me. Because I was able to live as a free person, free from, from my fear, from my resentment, from my self-pity. You know, that's a spiral. That's deadly as well. The healing of the gospel made me whole. Made me able to focus not on my pain, but on other people's wounds and bring the healing to them. My father was deeply wounded by sin and by Satan, but he rejected the healing. The healing of the gospel healed not only my family wounds, but my political wounds as well. I started to see people not through the lens of their nationality or ethnicity uh, or their political uh, affiliation, but how God sees them. I remember that uh, 14, 15 years ago, I recruited a staff when we lived back in Hungary who was about 10 years older than I am. And uh, he was a member of the Communist Party. And his father was pr pretty highly ranked in the Communist Party. And he had, you know, privileges. He had scholarships. He's, he could study in, in the best universities. Uh, I, but he became a Christian. I brought him on, uh, in, in, on staff with us. And I remember once we were traveling somewhere together, and he shared his life story, and, and I shared mine. And he was the beneficiary of our family's suffering. And because of people like him and his father, we've lost everything. So his gain was my loss. And I remember that, that um, he was asking me, how can you still talk to me? And that's when I, and I looked at him and said, well, that, that thought never crossed my mind. I mean, why, why do you, oh, you, you don't see yourself through the lens of Christ? I mean, we're, we're completely changed. It doesn't matter what happened in the past. You know, you, we, we both repented. We are both saved. We are both healed. We are, we, we're both completed uh, in Christ. There's just no, no difference. So, that's when, that's when I started to understand that really what people, what countries need, what countries need and what America needs as well, it's, it's not healed systems, but healed hearts. Because healed systems will not change this world. Healed hearts will Sick people with sick heart, sinful heart, are creating bad systems. So if we want to see changes in this country, it's, it's not start, we, don't, we don't need to talk about systems. We need to talk about people. And the only thing that will heal people's heart is the gospel. Nothing else. You know? And, and it's important to have political affiliation, voting the right way. It's all important. But don't think that this country is going to be changed because you vote a certain way. This country will be changed if people are coming to Jesus because they are the ones who are creating all this mess that we see right now. And that's why uh, 
you know, I became passionate about, well, I don't want to just, just focus on the system. I want to focus on the real problem, which the real problem is the heart of man. So this is, in a nutshell, my story that how, you know, God healed me. There, there are a lot of other details to that, but I'm, I'm not going to bore you uh, with that. But, you know, it's, I'm, I'm just amazed that, you know, I was someone who stuttered, did not speak English. You know, I, I hardly was able to get into high school and then went to university and God was gracious and merciful. Although, you know, at age 18, I was also so excited that, that I, I, you know, I was always out sharing my faith at, at, at the beach and it was just too much for the secret police. So they, they arrested me and they kicked me out from the university. Then I got back. That's, these are other stories. There are a lot of fun stories with that. And, and, you know, especially when you're 18, 19 years old, it's, it's, it's really fun that, gosh, the, you know, the, these evil communists are coming and they, you know, searching the home and all those uh, fun things. But, but uh, the, um, what I, what I want to uh, leave with you is, and tomorrow we're going to talk about this whole critical theory and contemporary critical theory and, and uh, how, you know, evil this is, but we need to remember that the devil has a teaching ministry. You know, we talk, we read about the teachings of evil spirits, the doctrine, that's what, that's what Paul uses, the doctrine of demons. And the only thing that can uh, overcome those, te those teachings, the demonic teachings, is the truth of the gospel. And that's what is going to heal people. And that's what we need to, to share. Uh, one quick story. Uh, um, well, I'm going to share that on Sunday. So you're going to hear that. I'm not going to tell that story. So uh, it's, it's about our neighbor who, you know, <laughs> she was just a really uh, unhappy lady. And we, we started a conversation with her <laughs> and you know, we were new to the States and her first thing when she learned that we're new to the States, she said, don't ever watch Fox News. <laughs> okay, that was her first thing. And she said, only stupid people are watching Fox News. And you don't want to be stupid. And, and, and I said, well, we don't know. I said, well, we started a conversation. Two hours later, she was in tears and we prayed for her. And now she is a greeter in a church. So, I mean, God can change people. <laughs> you know, if, but we, we, we did not get into, oh, you should watch Fox News or not. We started to, to share the love of Jesus with that person. And that's what's gonna, what healed me. And that's what's going to heal everybody in this nation. So thank you very much for your time.